Do we wait for like five minutes? Ever join Gale? If you share Jay Alam, you have to share this in the, the nurses' group. Uh, yeah, I understand. Actually, we also have an exam. But then, so I requested we we question uh, uh, we have to finish it, right? When is your exam? Twenty seventh of this month. Six hundred, eh? Are we lucky, Manu? Six hundred slides only, eh? Nurses were lucky. No, 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 no. I think the number of slides are increasing because of the pictures. Explanation that could make me for image based or style questions. Image each is for style. Direct questions are there. Image will be easier. Saturday and every day, right? Sir is not removing all these videos. He's keeping it because those people are all poor thing working now. Even doctors manage, but it's difficult for us. Because it's so much of portion. Okay, Manu, then we'll start. Yeah. Say something. Hi, good morning to one and all. So, uh, day two. So, let's start. Uh, we finished almost 104 slides yesterday. So we'll start with the 105th slide today. <coughs> uh, today we have uh, Akila. She's a nurse. She's joined us today offline. And very hi to all online nurses and brothers too. So let's start today. Okay. So how to measure patient's height? What are you supposed to do for uh, having the crutch for the patient? So first thing is you check the patient's height, and then you check the angle of the elbow, okay? And then you check the distance between the axilla and the crutch pad. You know how the crutch pad is, right? There's a padding over the crutch. So you're supposed to check the distance between the axilla and the crutch pad. These are all the important aspects for you to select a particular kind of a crutch for that patient. So distance between axilla and the crutch pad should be two to four fingers, two to four fingers. This much of distance is supposed to be there. If you don't keep any kind of distance and you end up having the crutch pad just immediately below the axilla, there is something called brachial plexus. There, there are a complex of nerves going down towards your arm, supplying your arm. So if you end up uh, holding the crutch pad too nearer to the axilla, you might end up causing pressure over the brachial plexus and that can cause damage to the brachial plexus leading to various issues in your arm like your nerves will be damaged which definitely leads to paralysis. <clears throat> so how much of distance? It is two to four fingers. So in centimeters it is four to five. So four to five centimeters of distance is supposed to be maintained between the axilla and the crutch pad. Distance between the anterior axillary fold to the point of crutch or lateral to the heel should be 15 to 16 centimeters. Just remember, this area is called anterior axillary fold. Okay, so this distance from the point of the crutch should be 15 to 16 centimeters. All this distance is for you to maintain. It's for easy holding, mainly to not uh, disturb the brachial plexus. Okay, any because all major arteries, vein, brachial plexus are all going like that. And this area is uh, whenever you're kind of doing 
if you've had, if in time done the section, you will know. You can see this nice chunk of nerves, that thick artery, the thick vein going through that. So this, this area is quite vascular and it has a good amount of nervous supply. So any kind of damage to that area can lead to complications. Next, points to be considered is never put your whole body weight on the axilla because it damages the brachial plexus that can cause paralysis of the arm. And that kind of paralysis is called crutch paralysis because that crutch is what is leading to the palsy. Palsy is nothing but paralysis. So two things you have to remember, distance between the axilla and the crutch pad from up to down should be two to four fingers width or four to five centimeters. Distance from the anterior axillary fold to the point of crutch lateral okay should be 15 to 16 centimeters that's almost equivalent to your small scale always support weight by the help of a flexed elbow so your elbow is not extended it's flexed okay flexion angle should be 25 to 30 that's not 300 it is uh, here it is it is not it is degrees okay 25 to 30 degrees of angle should be maintained at the elbow you're not supposed to do it in extension obviously when you're trying to hold the clutch your obviously your elbow is flexed just imagine suppose um, you are actually trying to hold a clutch just imagine if you are in that kind of situation if you are imagining just imagine yourself holding the clutch you never hold it like this you hold it a little bit with the flexion at the elbow and verify if this kind of angle you verify with the goniometer. You have a, a instrument to measure that angle that's called goniometer. Okay. Then wear flat shoes. Obviously, you don't wear heels uh, to provide a good base of support. And then you have to exercise to strengthen the upper arm because see your lower limbs are having a problem. Definitely, there has to be some strength in your upper arm for you to support your body weight on the upper arm. So you have to strengthen this upper arm, especially triceps. And elbow is important. Obviously, the whole upper arm is important because that is what is carrying your whole weight. Because your lower limbs have the paralysis. For a wide base of support, tripod position along with erect vertebrae, neck and head are very important. You don't slouch. This is called slouching, which we normally do on day-to-day -day basis. Always try to keep your vertebrae straight, your neck straight, your head straight. Don't slouch, don't droop your shoulders, don't hunch like that. If you do that, there are complications because you'll end up having a hunchback like this. We don't want that. Don't look down while, walk, while walking. When you're holding the crutch, you don't look down like that and walk, okay? You're supposed to look straight. You're supposed to keep your neck and head straight. Hunching your shoulder if patient uses too long. So suppose that the patient is on crutch for a very long time. What happens is he ends up hunching his shoulder. This is called hunch. Stooping is when you bend like that. Stooping of shoulders if the crutch height is too short. So when it is too short and to reach the floor, you try to decrease your height. So you end up stooping, which is not good again. So no hunching, no stooping. Keep your head straight. Keep your neck straight. Keep your vertebrae straight. I'm also slouching. Don't do it. Just keep it straight like this. Next. So this is these are the parts of the crutch. The first upper part here. This thing here is the crutch pad, okay? And then here you have the hand grip where you actually go and hold it. It's in the name, hand grip, okay? And then you have this uh, crutch length adjustment area where you can adjust the length accordingly to the patient's height. And crutch tip is what touches the floor, okay? These are different kind of crutches. So here is what which we see very regularly. This is the axillary crutch. This is a forearm crutch. This uh, is for temporary uses. So here your forearm, your arm is inside this. Okay. And then you're holding this area. Hmm? And then here you have one type of platform. You have a platform here. You can clearly see here. Okay. This is a one type of platform crutch. And then this is a cane. Cane with a crab foot. Why is it called crab foot? You have a tripod kind of thing here. This is called crab foot, okay? This is what all our uh, amamas and tatas use. This is standard crook cane, okay? And then you have a curved top. It's in the name. Don't, you don't have to think too much about it. This is a crook cane, crook, okay? And this is a curved top. This is a curved top, okay? And wherever you have these kind of holes, na, uh, 
these holes are all meant for adjustment of the height if you don't have a hole like this you can't adjust manu how do you okay and then here this is required for extra handle here you can see clearly this is you're holding it here but you're putting it you're putting your arm inside this and trying to hold this this is a spade handle kit and then here the name itself says it's four legged you have one two three four legs here it's a pyramid cane okay remember this is a pyramid cane it also looks like a pyramid So yeah, this uh, distance is supposed to be four to five centimeters. Four to five centimeters, and then the lateral, lateral distance. Lateral distance is supposed to be fifteen to sixteen centimeters. This four to five is from anterior to posterior, up to down. Okay, but this fifteen to cent sixteen centimeters is from the anterior axillary fold till the point of touch. That's your lateral distance. This is an axillary crutch because you have an axillary barrier. Okay, you have an axillary barrier, hence it's an axillary crutch. There is no rocket science in this. This is an elbow crutch because you you putting your forearm here, you're holding this handle. This is an elbow crutch because this goes and sits just above your elbow. Hmm? This is your gutter crutch. Here you can see it's a little different. so again here the distance between the anterior axillary fold to the point of crutch or the lateral to the heel should be 15 to 16 cm okay there are extra measurements here so from your foot till the point of crutch here should be 5 to 8 inches hmm? elbow is bent at an angle of uh, i just told you right 25 to 30 degrees which instrument do you use to measure is goniometer So yeah, I told you no slouching, no hunching, no extended neck. These are all wrong positions. Good posture is straight neck, straight head. It improves your confidence. Obviously, keep your vertebra straight. Don't slouch. This is all which, which is what very important because if you are using the crutch for too long, it might lead into hunching. And if you have a very short crutch, it might lead into stooping because you are trying to. Adjust the height bit by stooping. What is osteoarthritis? Yesterday we learned a bit about osteoarthritis, right? Because when we spoke about TKR, total knee replacement, you saw that osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and varied other diseases, they we have to like change the whole joint, which is completely damaged. The osteoarthritis, what does it do? Is it reduces the joint space, and when a bone rubs against a bone. you know you have a friction pain and that's like very painful condition imagine a stone is rubbing on with a stone how bad it is it's just like that with the bones so especially it happens in your weight bearing joints most what is the most weight bearing joint that you are aware about your knees your hip okay your ankle all these areas are very important and your lower body core that's where most of the people you know if you are like putting on weight very much suddenly you have put on weight many of them you see if the patients come to opd they'll come in of a lower back pain that's because of that amount of excessive amount of weight that the patient is put on okay so osteoarthritis is a non inflammatory it's a non inflammatory uh, degenerative joint disease so you don't have inflammation here it's a degenerative condition it's because of wear and tear okay most commonly affects weight bearing joints is remember it's non inflammatory because you have itis in the name the moment you have itis itis means inflammation but osteoarthritis is non inflammatory okay you don't see signs of inflammation there you don't see redness you don't see any kind of swelling okay pain you might have because of the friction and then you don't see any kind of uh, you know paresthesias because of it you don't see the signs of inflammation in osteoarthritis it's a slow process it's a degenerative joint disease so usually as your as on as the age increases this is this will start worsening or if you're putting on too much of weight it can worsen more faster 
most commonly affects the weight bearing joints so i've just told you imagine all all the joints in your lower limbs so the most most of your weight in the lower limbs is borne by your hips your knees so those are what which get affected very fast especially when we see uh, osteoarthritis what do you first think of is your knees because that's the most commonest joint which is involved and then you have your lower vertebral column okay most common form of arthritis this is the most common form of arthritis but it's a non inflammatory arthritis just remember that it's associated with aging and obesity so it's a slow process because your age will not run very fast it's a slow process but if you are obese it can worsen more fast what are the signs and symptoms you have presence of herbard and nodes and boucher so how we remember we doctors how we learn this so this is your hand okay and this herbardin and boucher nodes you can see it in your hand so this is your hand you know these here are called metacarpals this are carpals so you have metacarpals here. you have five metacarpals here just above your metacarpals you have phalanges in your hand forget about the thumb i'm talking about these four fingers here okay here you have uh, whichever is nearer to your body is proximal whichever is away from your body is distal these are phalanges you have suppose if you take my little finger you have 1 2 3 1 2 3 phalanges so this is your proximal interphalangeal joint this is your distal interphalangeal joint proximal and distal interphalangeal joints this is your metacarpophalangeal joint because this is a metacarpal and this is a phalanx so it's a metacarpophalangeal joint this is not involved here interphalangeal joints are what which is getting destroyed here. both are involved involvement of proximal and also involvement of distal so how i remember this is very silly okay b comes first h comes next so b is your proximal h is your distal so your boucher nodes here in your proximal interphalangeal joints and your herbard nodes here in your distal phalangeal joints this is how i learned there is no science here this is just pure patti So that's how we remember. That's how alphabetical order. So B comes first, hence your proximal joint is your boucher nodes, and H comes next. So your distal interphalangeal joint is your herbard nodes. A my dear, what happens is nodes. You can see nice kind of uh, hard uh, swellings over these joints. Okay, I'll show you a picture. So just remember, the proximal is boucher and the distal one is the herbard. Okay, and then you have joint stiffness and soreness of your joints. I told you pain is the condition here. Even though you have no redness, you don't have swelling regularly. Pain can be there because the patient is trying to walk. Because of that pain, what does the patient do? The patient doesn't wants to walk. There'll be stiffness in the joint because he's not using the joint more frequently. If he's trying to use the joint, the both bones are rubbing, causing intense pain. You know, he doesn't wants to use. It is a dull pain. It's not sharp. It's dull pain. Which increases with weight bearing. The more weight you put, the more the pain is. Rest will reveal. You know, completely uh, osteoarthritis patients they just want to take rest because it's a lot of pain. Remember, because it happens in aging, you take most of your rest in your aging. So you, the the moment there is a lot of pain, you want to just sit and just you know rest. Especially putting the joint a little high on a bed or another stool. the leaves if there is any kind of swelling because of that pain it will it will come down and the moment you give rest to that joint the pain will also come down okay and also you have decreased range of movements because of the pain definitely you, you won't feel like using the joint very often okay that's why you def- decreased range when you cannot flex it more you may not extend it more just imagine your knee whenever you are in pain you don't want to give a lot of movements in your knee so decreased range of movements is also there so just summary osteoarthritis is a non inflammatory arthritis it's the most commonest arthritis especially seen in the weight bearing joints what are those hip knee and lower vertebral column okay just imagine all your lower limb and your lower vertebral column okay and it is associated with aging and obesity you see bouchers in your proximal interphalangeal joints and you see herbardin in your distal interphalangeal joints you can see like the you can see, you can actually feel it it will it will nicely swell look like a nice peanut there okay right now you can't see any kind of swelling but it will swell how how gout looks imagine a gout here but without the redness it is hard gout is like softy softy but this is not like that this is like nice hard okay it's like a node and then you have joint stiffness 
you have soreness in the joint there is dull ache and there is decreased range of movements and the moment you take rest the pain goes down treatment because there is pain you have to give nsaids so what are the kind of nsaids we usually give is uh, you can give indomethacin sdi i told you for gout it works excellently well other than that most of the what we what do we give in india we give diclofenac we give acyclofenac that relieves the pain or you can give acet acetaminophen which is nothing but paracetamol okay salicylates you can give salicylates it also relieves the pain and then because there is stiffness in the muscles you can also give them muscle relaxants okay and then uh, for this degenerative change you can also give intraarticular steroids have you ever seen uh, doctors giving intraarticular steroids directly in the joint they will inject the steroid okay key nursing interventions uh, not just this also there are tablets called collagen tablets which improve the cartilage if the cartilage is getting worn out they'll also give uh, collagen but because in india we are we all follow most of us follow veganism so this collagen is all red it is all from the animal source there is no plant source collagen what till what i have heard about it comes from fish it comes from animals so collagen is all red so most of the people are hesitating to take it okay even collagen is given to improve the cartilage there so that cartilage is what it's a cushion so it's you are improving this cartilage you are improving this cartilage so whenever even the even if the joint space is reduced this cartilage will act like a chewing gum in between them and reduce the friction pain at least we can you know suppose that age age of the patient is just 45 yesterday i have told you for a tkr that's a total knee replacement the good age is between 50 to 80 so you want to wait for another 5 years for uh, us to change the knee so what do we do we give all these medicines so giving a collagen is also a very good thing because it will improve the cartilage it will improve that chewing gum thing you know in between the two bones it will reduce the friction pain the moment there is no pain the patient is happy because he will present he or she will present with he uh, will come to the op with a complaint of pain and decrease movement in that area okay next other than this hot or cold compression as ordered what i have known from uh, an orthopedician is Uh, what sir has told me is it's always better to use a cold compression because this is not inflammatory so usually uh, hot is also okay it depends on patient to patient my mom she is a hypothyroid so she cannot uh, take anything cold because they are intolerable to cold that she doesn't like things cold so she likes hot she feels ah very need low you know very hot water on her knees she feels more comfortable so it depends upon the patient's comfort but mostly cold compression is given for the joints next encourage patient to perform you have to tell the patient to you know walk not too much but at least daily activities they shouldn't sit completely take rest because that will end up into severe stiffness then that, that's not again good if you are not giving exercise to that joint then you'll definitely have stiffness if suppose knee is involved you can also do some exercises like patella pulling you can always do a bit of yoga where you don't put a lot of weight on your weight bearing joints okay swimming is also a very good exercise because the whole weight is taken up by the water so you're like floating in the water so there's no pain i'm talking all this with personal experience because i've seen my mom doing it so swimming is one of the best exercises for osteoarthritis yeah so here uh, as you can see these are the herbarden nodes i told you know distal joints this is herbarden nodes you can see the orange and whatever you get here are bouchers so boucher is nearer to your body b comes first so proximal is boucher distal interphalangeal joints is herbarden and you can see now it's all swollen like a nod hmm? have you any time seen drumstick you can see now like that drumstick looks like this na drumstick is never like this drumstick is like this like this Got it, na? I'm very sure you you guys would have seen drumsticks. You can see now that breech ka part, which is like a little swollen. That's how the nodes look like. Here you can see in the picture. So yeah, boucher you can see is your proximal, and herbarden you can see it's your distal. Here, if you take an X-ray and see, you can see how it's getting spoiled here. Hmm? These are your herbarden, which are distal, and this is your boucher. 
and this here this joint here is your uh, this is your metacarpal so metacarpophalangeal joints those are not involved just remember that hmm? there are only two conditions in which both uh, this is called pip okay i just tell you this this sorry this here is called pip pip okay and this here is called your dip dip is distal interphalangeal joint p is proximal interphalangeal joint so there is two conditions in which both are involved one is osteoarthritis other one is rheumatoid uh, psoriatic arthritis sorry in psoriasis and in osteoarthritis these are the only two conditions where both these joints are involved in remaining all conditions either it is pip or it is dip it is not both if both are getting involved think about two conditions one is also osteoarthritis second is psoriatic arthritis you can see again here swollen nodes so akila tell me what is this yes take a guess this is proximal so this is b on h no this is proximal it's nearer to your body which alphabet comes first so it's bouchons yeah if you have it distal here which is far away from your body it's h whichever is far away is h because h comes after b that's why we remember Okay, it will take one day for you. Go home and again revise. The skeletal traction. What is a skeletal traction? Uh, is you are using the bone. There is something called a Simon pin. Okay. Imagine this is your tibia. You know where your tibia is, right? It's in your legs. It's a big bone in your legs. You have tibia and fibula. So you are not touching the fibula, but you are doing with the tibia. So you have upper portion of the tibia. You are passing the pin into this. Okay. To this pin, we are putting a traction. It's like drilling. It's like drilling a nail into the wall. I have done it. It feels amazing. I know power pump for the patient, but when you are trying to drill this pin into the tibia, that's how you feel. You are drilling a, a nail into the wall. I'm very sure. You all would have hammered a nail into the wall, or you have drilled a nail into the wall. That's how it feels. That's how the machine is. You are attaching the pin to the drilling machine, and you are drilling this pin into the tibia because tibia is my strong bone. So you are putting a pin like this. Okay. Imagine this is your tibia. You are putting through and through here. Okay. And to this outside, you can see you can see this much part of tibia lying out. This is your tibia. This is your bone. You are putting a pin into it. Okay, from side to side. And you can see a little bit of pin on this side and that side. To this, we are adding those wires through which we are hanging a weight. So this is called skeletal traction. You're not using your skin here. You're not using your skin here. Yesterday I told you wherever you use your skin. Example, I've given you Bucks fascia. Bucks is where you're giving a skin traction, where the skin is used for traction. You apply a lot of plasters, and to that plasters you connect the weight. But here the pin which is passing through the bone. Usko you are connecting the weight, so this is a skeletal traction. You are using the bone here, so it's called skeletal traction. For example, hollow traction, skull traction. Even for skull, you can give a traction. You can put a pin through it, and you can hang a weight like that. You know, weight is put on the pins, pins which coming out, wires or screws which are attached surgically to the bone. Most commonly used for femur, especially it's used for femur. Yesterday I showed you. Many of you take selfies, na? I know how you know how a selfie light looks, right? Like this selfie light. You all know, na? How it looks around selfie light. Even Thomas Print looks like that. But it has, uh, it's a, it's like a selfie light with a, you know, with an attachment down here. In this hole, you're trying to fix. It's like a pajama, wearing a pajama. Okay, you're putting your leg into it, and to this plane, to this Thomas Print, you're attaching a weight. So Thomas splint is what which is used especially for femur because femur is all up, and this hole is coming is exactly near your thigh. Okay, this round thing is coming near your thigh, and that long thing is attached down to that. Who attach a weight? This thing is called Thomas splint. Remember this image. I'll show you again if it comes. Okay, it's preferred when continuous traction is needed. Imagine you are supposed to give a long traction. Like you are supposed to give it for a long time. 
skin if you use skin if you're using it for a long time you know what happens to skin imagine you wearing big heavy earrings what happens to your ear pinna does it drag does it lag your skin you know it becomes lax that's not good so skin is not used for a very long traction but skeletal it's in place it doesn't stretch like that so for long traction for a continuous traction skeletal traction is preferred so this is skull traction you can see the doctor has applied all kind of pins here okay into the skull he has bored into the skull with, with the surgical procedure and you are trying to give a traction yahan pe you are trying to give traction all it's in the outside like that hmm? this is called hollow traction this is thomas splint here uh, it's not very visible in this yeah Okay, it's not clearly visible. You'll have a round ear like this, and it will go down like that. Okay, this go you are applying weights here. All these weights are applied to that splint. It's called Thomas splint, which is especially used for all femur issues. Femur is your thigh bone. Okay. Total hip replacement. We learned about total knee replacement yesterday, but today we'll learn a little bit about hip replacement. what kind of uh, things you do what what part is removed what do we attach in it just little bit about it so what do you mean by total hip replacement or total rib arthroplasty arthro when the moment arthro comes its joint okay plasty is you trying to you know put some kind of an instrument or a mesh or some kind of uh, a prosthesis which is what is which is what called plasty replacement of severely damaged hip joint with prosthesis is nothing but artificial joint is what we call it as hip arthroplasty indications are osteoarthritis rheumatoid arthritis rheumatoid mein kya hota hai it's an autoimmune issue it will eat away your joint completely like you know like a rat eats a cow that's how it eat away your joint and then you have femoral neck fractures even for femoral neck fractures why femoral neck fracture is whenever the femur head or the neck is involved femur is very notorious it's a very knotty bone because the head of the femur ends up into avascular necrosis the blood supply to the femur head is cut off so what happens when there is no blood supply to a particular part of your body it ends up into necrosis so it's in the word avascular necrosis avascular means vasculature is not reaching the femoral head so because of avasculature it is ending up into necrosis usually if you have a fracture today suppose if there is a fracture in a patient today in that femur after 2 years they will develop because it is very knotty all that blood supply has to come back it it all depends upon the anatomy there what kind of blood supply is there the moment e area or that area is getting involved depends upon that how fast this necrosis can come and femur is very notorious for avascular necrosis hence you will always prefer a hip arthroplasty in a femoral fracture remember that i will not go into depth this much if you remember why because it will end up into necrosis and you don't want that patient to come back again with that kind of a problem so if you think he is an old patient you know usually femoral fractures happen in old patients when does it happen when they slip in the bathroom that's why we tell them to be careful you know go so slowly be very careful about the uh, things we use on our floor the flooring has to be water has to be visible so if you have some kind of granite or smooth tiles in your house uh, or you have marble in your house when you can't see water be careful tell the old patients to walk slowly if they slip and fall there are there is 90% chance of them developing a femoral fracture which is very bad for them because they are bedridden for long time and once you are bedridden old patients what happens you know bed sores we don't want that okay and if they are diabetic more problem so points to remember for the care of patient uh okay we'll not go into that point that's too much for you all just remember what why are we doing it one is osteoarthritis second is rheumatoid arthritis and third is in femoral neck fractures also hmm? so what are the things you are not supposed to do after an operation you're not supposed to cross the legs okay you're not supposed to bend the thigh more than 90 degrees suppose you're trying to approach an object you're trying to approach it don't bend 
try to take a cane or something and pull it towards you if you are bending more than 90 degrees it can cause problem there we don't want that this is all post operative okay okay and then uh, you are trying to keep a cushion in between your thighs even and you're not supposed to sleep suppose you have a femoral fracture on your right side you tell the patient not to sleep on that affected side okay he's been operated and you don't want the patient to go sleep on the right side because it will cause a problem definitely because of the pain that patient will not sleep he'll try sleeping on the left side so either the patient can sleep supine supine is sleeping on the back prone is sleeping on your front okay he can sleep so he can sleep prone he can sleep supine he can sleep on his left side if he has a right sided femoral fracture okay tell him not to sleep on the affected side tell the patient not to cross his legs tell the patient not to flex his thigh more than 90 degrees trying to approach any kind of objects either somebody is helping the patient or he is trying to pull it with a cane or a very long stick near him to ask him not to bend too much because the moment you bend the angle between your body and the thigh is reduced now you're not supposed to do it like that okay try to keep it 90 degrees or more than that but don't try to bend more next patient should not turn to the operative side as i've told you what are the do's you're supposed to use a high toilet you're not supposed to bend for a low toilet what you do you flex now you flex it a lot you don't want that they have to sit on a chair like thing which has a commode like well it's available nowadays especially these people who have underwent the operation or who have these kind of fractures are supposed to use like next use pillow between your legs while sleeping it's called an abduction pillow abduction means a d d add you're adding ante you're getting your legs near so opposite to it is abduction you're moving your legs away if you don't want your legs to come too near you don't want this abduction you're using a pillow which causes abduction simple okay and use long device to grab things instead of bending don't bend okay you're supposed to grab it with something or ask somebody to help you next always sit on a high chair okay with comfortable padded arms arms have to be padded because of this fracture you're using your forearms more na no? so you don't want to cause any kind of damage for this also because all these areas bony prominences you have everywhere nerves and vasculatures going on your bursas so if you're trying to put it long that is right share with you what is an olecranon bursa is this this is an olecranon process below it you have a bursa so students what do they do they sit like this and study so you're trying to put a more amount of weight on this bursa this bursa will get irritated and it will end up into a bursitis it's called olecranon bursitis also called a students elbow I've told you. So you don't want all this. You want this nice, soft, padded area. Okay. No, no hard chairs and all. Hmm? And then, why are you keeping things soft so that you don't have any kind of uh, pressure over that particular joint? You do, you want the vasculature to be normal. You don't want the nerves to be compromised. You have to keep the nervous supply and the vasculature going. So you always keep soft. Whenever you have a pressure source, what do you do? Use a water bed. Huh? So what is water bed doing? It's it's removing that hard surface. It's keeping the area soft, so that your skin is able to breathe, and all that vasculature or the nerve which is going below the skin is intact. It's not getting, uh, you know, getting crushed in between the hard surface and our bony area. It's very simple. Next, promote use of trapeze. This is a horizontal bar hung by ropes. You can see a triangle area where you have to hold trapeze. Pakarne ka is called trapeze. You you take that support. And next, you are using anti-embolic stocking. So whenever the patient is bedridden for a long time, you don't want DVTs. You know what is DVT, right? Deep vein thrombosis. When does it happen? You see pregnant ladies very commonly. So if they underwent LSCs, okay, uh, you they have they have undergone cesarean section. So because of that spinal anesthesia, they can't use their legs because they have no feeling in their legs. So the legs are lying in that position for a long time. Suppose if you are imagine if you are in a nice big hospital, so what do they recommend you? They recommend you to wear stockings. Why are you wearing stockings? You don't want the stasis. You don't want the blood to be accumulated in a, in an area and lead into a clot. That is very dangerous. If DVT happens, that patient will end up into pulmonary embolism and death can happen. You don't want that. What do you do? Either you do either use pressure stockings. Firstly, secondly. 
either you're doing some because of the fracture you definitely can't make the patient do any kind of exercise obviously so in these patients you're using some kind of drugs which uh, are antiplatelet drugs which break the clots or which uh, are blood thinners you don't want thick blood okay you prevent this formation of clots in this patient who are bedridden for long time who cannot use their lower limbs for long time are they use stockings or you put them on drugs okay maintain alignment of the fracture leg obviously if you want the fracture to heal you can't keep disturbing it all the time you have to keep the alignment you're not supposed to disturb that fracture area because of this non disturbance only these patients can end up into dvt so we don't want that so we put them for anti embolic therapy next signs and symptoms of hip processes dislocation suppose operation has occurred we have put the processes you have done the replacement of the joint what kind of issues can happen after the operation firstly is if it is not in place okay if there is some kind of issue firstly the patient will come complain of intense pain if it is not in place or if it's displaced second thing is shortening of the affected limb the whole idea of replacing and putting it back suppose you have your left limb here your right limb here your and your right limb has a problem you put a prosthesis but imagine the right limb has become very short there is some issue here because it is supposed to be in the normal length right same as the left limb but if it is after the operation if it is ending up into shortening then you have not done your job right or there is some issue with the prosthesis there you are supposed to reevaluate again you are supposed to take an x ray or a ct to check if there is any kind of issue whether the prosthesis has displayed or not next next Yeah, abnormal internal or external rotation. Normally, whenever the process is in is in place, you keep in your leg straight, okay. But if there is pain, the patient will try to put it a little internally or externally rotated. Have you ever seen displacement cases where the joint, where the femur head moves out of the acetabulum? Okay, in such cases, what you see is the normally our limbs are not internally rotated; they are neither externally rotated. We keep it straight. So if there is too much internally rotated, there too much externally rotated, it means there is some problem with the hip joint, or there is some problem with the processes there. Okay, and then what is obviously pain is the first complaint they have. Intense pain, there is swelling, immobilization of the affected limb. They are not even able to move the below part of the leg, and there is popping sensation. Okay, if there is a popping sensation, it is obvious that it is not in place. It has come up. They don't want that. So there are types of hip replacement here. It is a little bit of too much of information, but I don't know because sir is included. I am telling you all this. Okay. Here first thing, which is hemiarthroplasty. Why is it called hemi? Is this see this here in the hip bone? You have something called the acetabulum. Okay. In this, the femur head is going and sitting. So it's a this is a ball. This is a socket. The socket. is called acetabulum which is a part of the hip bone and this is your ball which is the femur head okay so here what you doing is you're not touching this acetabulum you're only changing the femur okay hence it is called hemi hemi means half if you're changing this acetabulum you're putting a process of here you're also changing this whole neck and femur head then it is total hemi is when you're not disturbing the acetabulum and you're trying to fix You're only changing this femur head, and you're trying to fix this here. Okay. What is total hip replacement here? Total hip is you're changing the acetabulum. You're also removing that damaged femur head along with the neck. You have the femur head here, the half head, along with the neck part here. Okay. This is the neck part, and here you have the head. All this is being removed off because it's all damaged. And you're also removing all the acetabulum here. You're putting another processes here. You can't see it very clearly here because it looks like one shadow. But if you see in a proper imaging, you can appreciate. Are they either this, this, and that will be little different from each other? Okay. What is resurfacing total hip arthroplasty? Resurfacing means the femoral head and the acetabulum are replaced. Only the neck. This is the neck of the femur, which is not dis disturbed. You can see now clearly. Only the acetabulum and the femoral head. If you see something like a lollipop, this looks like a lollipop, na? Or like a ice cream. So if you see, the, I heard that you don't have any kind of images 
if images come it's easy to identify it so imagine if you see a lollipop kind of thing this is resurfacing because you're not disturbing the neck here all this neck is retained the neck of the femur is normal only are changing above acetabulum at the head this is re this is all normal so if head or acetabulum ko change karte hain isko bolte hain replace resurface okay if you are changing acetabulum head and neck all three are being removed and processes are attached it's total if you are allowing the acetabulum is normal you're not doing anything to it you're only changing the femur and the neck it is called hemi okay this much if you understand it's enough see you can see clearly here in this picture this is the acetabulum shell you can see it's attached here this is screwing so we have put a separate acetabulum we have put a head of the femur we have put a neck of the femur so this is total hip replacement okay here you can see na clearly you have a separate acetabular cap you have a separate head and you have a separate neck this is total so here you see if, if this is the acetabular component cap like thing okay you have a plastic liner in between this is the femoral head and this is the femoral stem which acts like the femur's neck this is how it looks once it's once it is in place okay again a total hip this is how it looks when you take an x ray this is a normal this is normal and here there was a fracture so they underwent an operation and you have done tk thr next again this is a nice image but this is how an x ray will look like just remember this okay here you are also can clearly see acetabulum is separate you can see a head of the femur and you can see the neck so again this is total hip replacement This is abduction pillow. ठीक है. You also use this pillow for people who have cervical spondylitis. We use it because you have to keep that angulation. So just remember, this is abduction pillow. It is causing abduction. It is separating both the limbs. Abduction is adding. Adding मतलब getting both your limbs nearby. Abduction is pushing it away. You don't want the limbs to come near. You are supposed to maintain a little bit of distance. So whenever they are trying to sleep, so imagine this lady has a femoral fracture. will think she has a fracture in her left side hence she she's not sleeping on the left side you're not even supposed to bend your legs like that you keep it straight but remember this pillow is nothing but abduction pillow hmm? and this you use it post operatively next ibd inflammatory bubble disease what there are two things in inflammatory bubble disease the name itself says the bubbles are inflamed okay so what do you have you have crohn's ठीक है and you have ulcerated colitis these are two names you supposed to remember what are the differences between crohn's and ulcerated colitis i'll give you a brief idea if you go too much in depth it will become doctor's portion we'll go a little bit in depth it will be nurse's portion we'll stick to that okay what are the differences so remember crohn's crohn's is something uh where imagine if this is a bubble okay you have a lesion here you have a lesion here you have a lesion here this is crohn's crohn's matlab it has skip lesions matlab you'll have an issue here but this area is normal again issue here again this area is normal again issue here you have skip lesions it is not continuous okay this is crohn's but whereas ulcerative colitis you have a continuous issue in the whole bubble you have this issue crohn's may you will have uh, involvement of transmural membrane transmural matlab neural matlab you just remember transmural is getting and all three layers also can get involved but with ulcerative colitis it's only the submucosa or the mucosa submucosa that's like the superficial layer of the bubble lining gets involved okay submucosa or mucosa theek hai but whereas crohn's may all layers can get involved you have skip lesions but here you have an issue again it is normal here again you have an issue 
and Crohn's can occur anywhere in the whole digestive tract. But ulcerative colitis is not like that. Ulcerative colitis will occur in the rectum area. Okay, in the rectum area, say, leke, backward it can come towards the colon. What do you have in front of the rectum? Is the colon, right? The descending colon. So, this is your ascending colon, this is your transverse colon, this is your descending colon, you have a sigmoid colon and you have a rectum. Hmm? Pe ulcerative colitis hota hai. And it goes back like this. This is ulcerative colitis. Okay, but whereas Crohn's can occur anywhere in the body. Crohn's is something which loves your GI tract. It can happen anywhere. It doesn't want to be continuous. It can skip areas. So you have skip lesions in Crohn's. Okay. And ulcerative colitis is very sincere fellow. This fellow will cause more problems, but it will occur very continuously. It's, it's in, our, in our textbook, it is called backwater, backwater or backlash. Yes. Backlash, okay? it's occurring first in rectum and then it is going backwards. So whenever this patient, usually the commonest area of Crohn's you see is ileum and cecum. Okay? So imagine this ileocecal junction. This is your right side of the body. This is where your appendix is, right? Hmm? And this is your left side of the body. This much you know, now where your rectum is, rectum is on the left side. You know that your ileocecal junction is on the right side. So imagine a Crohn's patient comes to you. Imagine the patient is coming to you. Mostly what are the complaints? Okay, they will have diarrhea. Hmm? Inflammatory bowel disease. What do you first think about inflammatory bowel disease? You know this patient has loose motions. Diarrhea is there. Usually in ulcerative colitis, it is bloody diarrhea. You have blood in the motion. 100% you have. But in Crohn's, maybe there, may not be there. Why may be there? Because if, if it occurs here in rectum area and in this colonic area, it can cause bloody diarrhea. But if it is here or somewhere in the esophagus or somewhere in the stomach or somewhere in the ileum, it's very rare for you to see this kind of bleeding in Crohn's. So whenever a patient comes to you, Diarrhea is compulsory. Ulcerative colitis of 100% bloody diarrhea. Crohn's may, may be or may not be there. Just remember that much. And they will have abdominal pain. So if the patient is complaining of left-sided abdominal pain, always think about ulcerative colitis first. If they are complaining about right-sided, it is not ulcerative colitis. It is 100% Crohn's. Or it can be appendicitis. But in appendicitis, you don't have diarrhea. It's a pain. It's a pain. You have vomitings. But here in Quran's what do you have? You have a right-sided pain here, right-sided iliacal pain, along with diarrhea. Think about Crohn's. If you have a left-sided pain and you have bloody diarrhea, think about ulcerative colitis. These differences you're supposed to know. Next, um, I've already told you about skip lesions, right? You have polypoidal skip lesions. And because of this button-like thing, have you ever seen cobblestone? If people, if you have seen this old English movies, you will see these cobblestones. You will have madhya madhya, you have these grass areas, okay? And you have stones kept like this. This is how Crohn's will look. Imagine this is all normal tissue in between, okay? This is all inflamed tissue. Hmm? It will look like a cobblestone. I'll show you a picture. We'll come to this later. Let us finish Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Okay, when the picture comes, I'll show you. Yeah, it is there. I've seen the PPT. I'll show you. Is the speed okay, Akhil? You're able to understand. You stop me wherever you have that. Okay. So, as I've shown, as I've drawn here and shown, have you seen Cadbury? Cadbury, everybody knows how Cadbury looks like, na? Imagine a big piece of Cadbury. How do you it's all squares, squares, squares? It's all like, like, uh, you know, it's not flat like that, it's slightly up, na? Imagine silk, Cadbury silk. You know how it looks like. That is how cobblestones look like. Cobblestone appearance will be there in cross. Because you have normal tissue in between, a dip is a normal tissue, and that swollen area is all, Inflamed tissue. That's why it look like a cobblestone in Crohn's, not an ulcerative. Ulcerative is a continuous, a sincere fellow, but it will heal cause cancer. Ulcerative colitis can lead into colonic cancer. Crohn's 
usually it will not cause cancer when when they are caught cancer whenever it is getting involved into a colon if colon area this area is involved it will lead into cancer it's more notorious for cancer but whenever you think about ulcerative colitis because i'm telling that it is occurring only in this area it will in future it will end up into cancer so you have to be careful in ulcerative colitis patients okay so uh, whenever you are supposed to do imaging of the upper gi what is upper gi you think about whenever you think about upper gi what do you think about you think about esophagus you think about your pharynx you esophagus and then you go down you think about your stomach okay all this is all upper gi tract hmm? so what do you do you will give a barium so this barium this barium sulfate solution is colorless it's odorless it is tasteless you tell the patient to drink that solution and then we do the imaging you take series of x rays to see how this liquid is filling up the lumen lumen is nothing but a hollow tube so it, if there is any kind of issue like if there is a cancer what will happen in cancer lumen will never look so if you think this is normally your lumen is supposed to be nice and straight like this think about your esophagus okay if your esophagus is like this because of a growth inside okay there is a growth inside here will think it is cancer okay so the barium will go normally till here and in this area only in this area it will fill up it will fill up it will look as if whenever you see an x ray it will look as if your barium is like this it will thin up and again it will become normal so this area you have to always suspect cancer cancer you have to sub suspect there might be some kind of esophageal cancer or achalasia cardiac there some conditions so it's a filling defect that liquid is trying to fill up the lumen and you're taking all x rays you're taking all pictures to see how it is filling up if it is filling up well the lumen is nice and big there is no issue but if you have any kind of ulcer or any damage to that area the lumen can thin down so the moment it thin down on an x-ray it look as if it has thin down like a small fiber of a thread and again becoming normal wherever the lumen is normal so this this is where we use barium swab so a radio opaque why it it look on an x-ray it's opaque radio opaque liquid like barium sulfate is ingested by the client so as the patient to drink it it is tasteless it is odorless it is non granular it is completely insoluble and non absorbable liquid why do you need insoluble and absorbable in the quantity if you are taking it and it is soluble so it will get absorbed by the tissue so you don't want that we want it to be lying in the lumen only so it should not be absorbed it should be swallowed it should come out through your either with your urinary tract or in your uh, motion it's supposed to come out whatever goes in has to come out so it has to be insoluble only if it is insoluble it will stay in the lumen if it is soluble it will get absorbed off we don't want that okay and if it gets absorbed off it firstly it's not good for our tissues secondly all your tissues will look radio opaque we don't want that hmm? second thing is it is non absorbable liquid it shouldn't be absorbable it should be insoluble and then you take series of pictures you take multiple x rays to see how that barium is filling up the lumen in double contrast study double contrast is what first you use a thick barium suspension to see the outline of the gi tract and then you give a tablet to to release carbon dioxide in presence of water you have water in your lumen right our body is 70% water so double contrast means first your double contrast means first you giving a thick barium just to see the lumen the wall of the gi tract and then later on you're giving a tablet which produces carbon dioxide once it comes in touch with the water there is a reason for it this is to uh, before doing all this you supposed to ask the patient whether they are allergic to all these or not that's very important you should do a small allergen test to see whether they are allergic to iodine shellfish seafood if they are then you can't do this procedure because they'll end up into anaphylaxis we don't want that patient is advised to maintain low residue diet obviously if you eat chicken mutton and come 
how it will get digested it will not get digested satric food that's what we say no you eat all which is easily digestible like easily digestible soft rice idli or uh, not dosas again idli and take lots of juices which are, because why we want all our lumen to be clean we don't want feces sitting inside if feces is sitting definitely the barium is not going to move okay so you are supposed to tell the patient to eat a low residue diet which gets easily digestible and you have free motions okay that is one thing then you tell the patient to eat nothing because if you eat and come it will sit nicely in your tummy and if you are putting a barium definitely it will not work so otherwise some people uh, even though it is odorless some people have this kind of nausea nausea for that barium so if they end up vomiting no use and the nail by mouth you are not supposed to eat anything from your mouth especially from 12 o'clock in the night till the test happens in the morning for all barium swallowers for barium testing you you call patients in the morning because it's it's supposed to be empty nothing from your mouth second just like a surgical procedure nothing nail by mouth at least 12 hours before and then the physician in the night just like for your surgical procedures you give laxatives because you want all your bowels to be cleaned up you don't want anything to be sitting you don't want the feces to be uh, lying in your bowels and saying hi hello to you when you're taking the next day you don't want that so you want your bowels to be cleaned out so you are beginning laxatives in the patient to clean the gi tract then ask patient to refrain from smoking in the morning before the examination no smoking in the morning next withhold all medications which have influence on gi tract so any medications which work on gi tract have to be withheld because it will cause disturbances with the barium studies we don't want that next after the procedure fluids are encouraged in the ku why why do you ask the patient to drink more water to flush out all the toxins so here the toxin is barium you want it to be flushed out very fast in the body so the moment we are done with that barium uh, studies we tell the patient to take more amount of liquids so that it's all washed away in the urine it comes out in the urine and in the feces stool color will be uh, changed to chalky white because of barium simple if you see chalky white stools don't panic it's because of that barium which you have swallowed okay if a patient is get if a patient is taking tablet metformin it has to be withheld and alternative medicines need to be taken if you are a diabetic patient so you ask the patient to stop because it uh, causes certain changes with your gi tract we don't it's oral medicine so we don't want that we want the barium swallow to be neat so we'll tell the patient metformin nahi leke aana don't have your metformin tablets instead put them on some other rich things what is the other best thing insulin is there small doses you can give if they are if they are very high sugars If they are maintaining good sugars for one day, you can tell them no metformin. Okay. After the barium studies, they can have the normal food and they can take their metformin regularly. Why metformin is being told is first thing is it reacts with that barium and it causes something called as lactic acidosis. We don't want that. Okay. Remember, metformin combines with the barium leads to lactic acidosis. hence we are telling the patient especially not to take metformin before this procedure hmm? so this is how we can see you can see the fluid inside here right all this gray matter inside grayish thing inside is your barium liquid going down hmm? here you can see how the lumen is thinned out there is some issue there you supposed to suspect this picture is not good i show you another picture yeah this see here uh what is happening is all that white barium fluid is all here it is coming normally inside but the moment it is coming here because of that space occupied lesion or that cancer the lumen is all thinned out so it's not able to enter completely there is a filling defect here it is not happening how it is supposed to happen here here you can see all thinning up you supposed to suspect a cancer in this patient theek okay? hai this is how it will look if you have an issue otherwise it's supposed to look like this completely white nice lumen like this it's supposed to be like this is how normal barium studies look like so if you have an issue it will thin out it will thin out here but if you don't have an issue this is how normal it looks like neat lumen with a proper barium going till down theek hai next coming back to osteoarthritis i have already told you it affects the weight bearing joints 
most common type of arthritis. There is something called swanmic. This is how swanmic looks like. You can see, now it looks like hamsa. Hamsa. I know. I think many of you know what is hamsa. You know what? How a swan looks like. You see the neck of the swan, na? They say that's how it looks like swanmic. And this, the most common complication which causes swanmic is your rheumatoid. Rheumatoid arthritis is what leads to swanmic. What is swanmic? You have hyperextension at your pip. Whenever I say pip, it's your proximal interphalange. Whenever I say dip, it is your distal interphalange. So pip me you have hyperextension, and yaha pe dip me you have flexion. So what is happening is all your you have tendons which go in your palm also. So whichever they get attached here, okay, they get attached here. So what happens is the uh, extensors. Extensor tendons are getting damaged here. Whatever are getting attached in this dip area are getting damaged here. So once they are damaged, there is no muscle which leads to extension. What happens? All the flexors are very active. They will say, ah, extension is not help, not working, so we'll do flexion. They will they'll end up into flexion. And here you have hyperextension. So here you have a problem, here you have a problem. All those extensors which come and attach at your dip are getting damaged. So all the active flexors will flex this first phalanx. That's why a swanic kind of a deformity develops. That much if you know it's, it's enough. The swanic is happening in rheumatoid arthritis. I'm telling you about this extras and flexors because you're supposed to remember why is it happening. Because those tendons are getting damaged. Other tendons are strong. You have a, see in, in universe, whenever imagine a centrifugal or a centripetal force, any kind of force, equal and opposite reaction you have. No? If one force is trying to pull, the other force is trying to push. So you have, if you have one action, there is an opposite action also to it. Even here, if you have flexor tendons, you have uh, if you have flexor tendons on the front side, you have extensor tendons. Because you can't just have one tendon. You need to have both flexion and extension of the joint. So you have both kind of tendons. If one of them is damaged, the other one is good. So that, that action will occur. So here extensions are getting damaged. So flexors are good now. So flexors, are, flexors will become overactive. Whenever both the tendons are there, both are normal, they will control each other. You can control the action of the joint. Whenever one, one extensor or a flexor gets damaged, the other one will become overactive. So, here in rheumatoid, extensors are getting damaged. The flexors are becoming overactive. Hence, it will lead into flexion. So, what else is there in that slide? So, what is happening here? Rheumatoid arthritis is the most commonest cause of your swan neck deformity of your fingers. Next. In... Uh, Osteomyelitis is what? Osteomyelitis is infection of your bones. Hmm? It's in the name itself. Don't think it is inflammation, it is infection of your bones. And which is the most commonest organism, which is the most naughtiest bacteria? Staph. Staphylococcus aureus is what can cause deep infections. Especially with the skin and the bones below, it can cause osteomyelitis. Whenever osteomyelitis comes to your mind, think it's an infection of the bone and the causative is Staphylococcus aureus. There are very few bacteria which you have to remember, I think, in your uh, subject. Especially staph, you have to remember. It will cause most of the problems. It troubles some bacteria. Hmm? It will come cause a lot of problems in the body. Next, osteomalacia. What osteo on the bone? Malaysia softening of the bone. Okay. What is happening is, I told you there are two things in the bone, two actions of the bone. One is bone formation, which is called osteoblastic activity. Blast is increasing. Okay. Then you have bone resorption, which is osteoclastic activity. Clast is cutting. C is C. Clast is cutting. Okay. It is called resorption. And Bone formation is blast. It is increased in size. So it's called osteoblastic. Oste bone formation is osteoblastic. Bone cutting is resorption is osteoclastic. 
if you have any problem in either plastic activity or plastic activity or both they'll end up into brittle or soft bones which will lead into fractures this sign means fracture is called fracture okay so kya ho raha hai what is happening in osteomalacia you have softening of the bones why because it is resorption okay osteoclasts are becoming more overactive they're causing resorption they're leading into porous bones the softening of the bones that is what is osteomalacia just remember osteomalacia softening of the bone due to impaired bone metabolism there is problem in either of it either this or that it can cause any kind of issues for doctors we need to know what is the problem there for you just remember these two activities are responsible for bone issues either there is problem with the bone formation it's like you are living in a house you are buying saman okay you are also supposed to throw the kachra no i'm saying you can't keep kachra accumulating in the home so you're supposed to have plastic activity plastic activity is getting things into your home resorption or plastic activity is removing waste from your home both have to be balanced suppose you buy too much okay too much of things get accumulated in your house what will happen your house will start looking very small very suffocated what will plastic plastic activity is removing the kachra if that reduces or if that becomes too much the throwing away too much of things even that is not good so you need you need to have a balance whenever this is there is harmony in the house it's the same here in the room i'm just giving you a silly example you can understand with that example okay so uh what is happening in osteomalacia is you have softening of the bone because of the bone impaired bone metabolism it is primarily because of inadequate calcium phosphate and vitamin d these three things are very important for the bone the bone loves calcium we always know calcium is important vitamin d is important all of you will forget phosphates phosphates are also very important so it's calcium phosphate and vitamin d these three things are very important or a normal bone metabolism hmm? if there is a decrease in all these three things it can lead into softening of the bones leading into osteomalacia that's the term given for softening of the bones yahan pe kya hota hai whenever you have resorption all that ex, that, that calcium is needed for the bone formation if you are if you are actually cutting away the bone what happens all this calcium will get accumulated in the serum the serum calcium will rise you are excreting out the calcium from your urine but we need we need to we need the bones to be strong for a strong bone what do you do you need more calcium but yahan pe kya ho raha hai resorption it is cutting away the bone it is making the bones more soft so it will lead to softening of the bones loss of calcium loss of phosphate and if you have vitamin d very less in your body osteoblastic activity will not happen properly you need bone formation for a strong bone So if that doesn't occur because of the vitamin D deficiency, it can lead into osteomalacia. Hmm? So remember, calcium, phosphate, and vitamin D are on the lower side in osteomalacia, and you have soft bones here. What is osteoporosis? Osteoporosis means there is problem with both. Plastic activity is a problem. Plastic activity is a problem. क्या होता है? The bones don't form properly. Kachra has to be removed. The kachra is not getting removed. All that waste, chatta bone is remain, you know, remaining. All the bones will become porous. Porous means what? More holes. Okay, I show you a picture. That is, and they become brittle. Brittle means easily breakable. It easily break. That's called osteoporosis. Where do you see osteoporosis most most often? Especially in women. If you're thinking about osteoporosis, you need to ask their age or whether they have attained the menopause. After menopause, estrogen, which is very important for us to function for a female, it's a it's a it's a hormone which is protective for the women. it protects us from high cholesterol it protects us from heart attacks it also protects us from osteoporosis so once you have attained menopause all issues start and we become equivalent to males so we can have all these problems we can have heart attacks the cholesterol can go gay while it can increase and also the women will suffer with osteoporosis hence after they attain menopause we increase the calcium intake in that women so that they don't have this osteoporotic changes more fast there so osteoporosis remember the bones are brittle brittle matlab um, like uh, imagine like a small i i will not say chalk if i say chalk it will become easy brittle means like 
just let me think about an example brittle is easily breakable anything which breaks easily is brittle it's not strong but when of osteomalacia it becomes very soft this two differences you remember osteoporosis is brittle bones osteomalacia malacia is all soft bones how do you manage you suppose water is deficient you supposed to pump them with those things you giving calcium you giving vitamin d which is the best source of vitamin d is the sunlight so tell those lazy people to get up early in the morning and sit in the sunlight at least for half an hour so sunlight which comes before 8:30 or 9 you supposed to sit in that even for us even though we have not attained our menopause sunlight is very important don't think about oh i'm going to tan and all that that is not going to work morning sunlight is very important for all of us don't apply any kind of creams and all expose yourself to sunlight this is all we can stay at home na if you have all elderly people in home they love to sit in the sunlight that is very good habit tell them not to especially during covid what happened we all push them inside the house don't come out don't come out don't come out but in their houses they can sit on the terrace that's not a problem everybody gets sunlight okay so sit expose yourself to sunlight is what is very important and if i being if i being honest with you vitamin d test is very costly outside it's like almost 2500 3000 rupees for a serum vitamin d levels so all of us can't afford we can't get it done regularly serum calcium we can check what happens people blindly outside without checking vitamin d levels without checking calcium levels you start pumping up pumping them with tablets please don't do that always check the levels of the calcium and vitamin d at least once in a year we can get it checked suppose the vitamin d levels are too low then we are supposed to give a bolus bolus ante we giving an injection it has 6 lakh units one injection of vitamin d after that we can put them on 60k or we can give them regularly 3000 international units or 2000 international units along with your calcium tablets very common brand which we use is shellcal so say you have shellcal you have shellcal hd you have shellcal hd 12 so these combinations are very important normally what we recommend is daily dose of vitamin d that is like 2500 or 2000 iu iu means international units per day along with your calcium why we giving with the calcium is it helps in easy absorption of the calcium okay so always get your blood test done and then you start them on the supplements because too much of calcium in the body suppose they coming to us with bony pains problem can be something else but what we people think is ah calcium maybe calcium is less and you put them on calcium but if there is too much of calcium in the body it will end up into renal stones imagine you having a glass of water and you are adding 10 spoons of salt what happens if it sediment down na that water is only used to 5 spoons of salt but if you are adding 10 spoons all that will sediment down. all that will stay down and we don't want that theek okay? hai So this is a normal bone here, and this is uh, you can see all these porous regions have increased. This is rickets, okay? Osteomalacia, you have softening of bones. If it is osteoporotic, it will be more big, big holes you can see here. That is osteoporotic. This is don't see this picture because I heard from Akila that you don't have image-based questions. Just remember that soft bones, मतलब Malaysia. brittle bones matlab osteoporosis so you can see osteoporosis here see how brittle they are even if i hold it and do like this to tuck it will break that that how your bone becomes this is how it is supposed to look normally but this is how it will become if you have osteoporosis what is pages pages is a disorder of bone remodeling process what happens is body absorbs old bones so what is absorb absorption and in the what the body mean by absorption all those old bones have to undergo resorption okay bone resorption occurs all that abnormal kachra has to be removed off by the body and you need to have new bone formation if there is any problem with both of this it can lead into pages so body absorbs old bones and forms abnormal new bones it's not forming strong new bones it's forming abnormal new bones so pages disease of bone most commonly occurs favorite areas of pages is pelvis skull and legs especially pelvis remember p for pages p for pelvis okay i show you how it looks like you can see all these areas of bone formation all these whitish areas of bone formation 
in between your wall resorption all this gray areas huh so you have both issues here okay it will look as if i won't say salt and pepper it will look as if uh, there is a term for it i forgot whenever i remember i'll tell you there is a term for it so paget's disease may you have both issues kachra is not being removed all bones are supposed to be dissolving the body has to dissolve those old bones that has to form good new new normal bones there is a problem with the resorption there is an abnormal bone formation if there is no balance between these two pages are lost okay pelvis is the most favorite area pages loves pelvis even in skull it occurs this is how it looks so you see all this whitish areas of bone formation and here and all you have a resorption you have all like salt and pepper like only like you have like gray areas like black areas you have little white areas to look like all dots if you have this kind of a skull or that kind of a pelvis think about pages first okay what is rhabdomyolysis rhabdomyoma means what muscle lysis breaking down so whenever that patient has had any kind of an injury to the muscle has had an accident where most of the muscles are crushed whenever there is there there are certain things which happen in the body so it's called it's referred to as breakdown of muscle tissue due to muscle trauma which may be which may result in myoglobin myoglobin the moment the muscle is broken down myoglobin is released okay somehow the myoglobin has to come out of the body na especially it comes out through your urine as myoglobin urea if you test the urine for myoglobin it is on the higher side because there is muscle damage all that myoglobin which is the component of the muscle is being released into the urine so this leads into myoglobinuria presence of myoglobin in urine is called myoglobinuria and whenever you have a myoglobinuria always suspect there is trauma to the muscle in the body what happens is all this myoglobin na it it doesn't easily uh, it you have a glomerulus right in your kidney it has to come through the vessel and get absorbed into the urine it doesn't happen it's a big molecule if it gets accumulated in that area it will cause damage to the kidney kidney doesn't like myoglobin if that myoglobin is coming getting stuck with the kidney na it will cause damage to the kidney and renal renal damage is not good it's a very bad prognosis we don't want that so remember that rhabdomyolysis is breakdown of the muscle especially whenever there is a trauma it's extensive trauma there is a tissue injury there is a crush of the muscles all this myoglobin in the urine will accumulate in the kidneys leading to renal damage if you don't treat it 100% the patient will end up into a renal failure and what are what renal failure ante anything what are the signs of renal failure they have less anuria that's like bad it's like acute renal injury and you don't want the patient to end up in that kind of a problem what are the signs and symptoms because of the breakdown of the muscles you have muscle weakness you have tenderness because of the breakdown and you have swelling because injury has happened definitely you have a swelling you have dark reddish brown you can show you the color myoglobin imagine muscle and again what do you think of the color of the muscles brown what how does a muscle look it's all brown in color so imagine this myoglobin is in the urine it urine also will look brown normally urine is not brown right it is in bile color it's like light yellow okay if you're taking good amount of water it is dark yellow especially in the morning because nobody takes water in the morning so concentrated urine comes but if this muscle protein is getting released into the urine it will turn brown next what is the treatment treatment is you have to flush out all this myoglobin you don't want it staying in the glomerulus you have to increase the gfr gfr means glomerular filtration rate the filtration has to occur more fast so that all this dirty myoglobin gets released into the urine and you urinate it it should not get accumulated in the kidney because if it gets accumulated it will cause damage to the kidney so you have to push it out first by pushing is done when you give fast fluids and that will happen if you give iv crystalloids you have crystalloids in iv fluids right so whenever you give this crystalloids it will increase the gfr leading to flushing out of this accumulated myoglobin into the urine and hence preventing a renal damage diuretics also is meant for flushing diuretics what does it do it will force the body wherever you have accumulation of fluid it will force it to uh, it will force the patient to urinate it will increase the gfr and one more thing is dialysis last option is dialysis so if the patient comes to you in the last stage 
where there is renal kidney issue, what do you do whenever the kidneys are not working? You do a dialysis. You clear it with the machine outside. What is compartment syndrome? Whenever, uh, suppose you have had a fracture here, an arm or a leg, that's where you have good amount of musculature. And there is injury inside. You have a compartment, you have a, you have a room like thing inside where all these muscles sit tightly. So whenever there is crush injury, what happens whenever there is crush, there is bleeding, there is edema. The pressure inside this compartment increases. If the pressure goes above 30 mm, it's dangerous. What, what it will do, it will cause a pressure force on the muscles. The muscles will thin down. Okay, that patient will leave. Suppose if you have a compartment syndrome in the forearm, you have had some kind of injury to this area, all those muscles are crushed. It will lead into compartment syndrome. You can see an edema, clear, visible edema. And the first complaint of the patient will be pain. And with the pain, all the muscles are getting involved. Now, whenever the muscle is getting involved, the attachment of the muscle is a tendon, which is getting attached to bones here. It will lead into contracture. You have to release it. If you don't do it, it will lead into a permanent damage. That's called compartment syndrome, which is an emergency. You have to do a fasciotomy. What do you fasciotomy? Suppose you have too much of pressure inside. What do you do? You give a nick here, you give a nick here, you release the pressure. Whatever the edema is accumulating inside, you have to get it out. You have to release the pressure. Taki, there is no damage to the vessels inside, especially the blood vessels and the nerves. And also you remove that amount of pressure which is causing compression over the muscles. This is called compartment syndrome. We will not go into depth of it, just remember what is compartment syndrome. We don't want that. So what do you do? You immediately cut open. You release the pressure, which is nothing but fasciotomy and debridement. Debridement is removing all the dead tissue. Okay. I'll show you how those cuts look like. So this is the dark brown urine you see in myoglobin urea. Myoglobin causes this kind of color in the urine. We are jumping to hernia. What is hernia? Hernia is nothing but protrusion of an organ through a weakened wall. Normally you have abdominal wall. Suppose that patient has some area of the wall is weakened. So what happens? You have some kind of abdominal pressure, right? Suppose if that patient has excessive amount of cough. Okay. Let's just imagine the patient is smoking. Lungs are not good. They have a lot of cough. COPD patients have cough. If the patient has TB, they have cough. They cough for, or they are allergic. They also have cough. Allergic cough is also there. What does cough do in the body? It increases the pressure. So once the pressure increases, once there is a weakened wall, with that pressure, all these bubbles will get pushed outside and it will form a pouching, out pouching. In that pouch, they go and sit. That is nothing but hernia. We have different type of hernias. First hernia which, which we learn, which is which can be you know managed, is the reducible hernia. The name itself says you can reduce this. The, the moment you put pressure over that sac, you can push all the contents back into the abdomen. It is reducible. That swelling is reducible. But the moment you ask the patient to cough, again that swelling comes. Cough impulse. You know what is cough impulse, right? You tell the patient, if suppose if that patient has an inguinal hernia, okay, you make the patient stand. You ask the patient to move on the side. Of course, you don't want him coughing on your face. So you look, you'll ask him to see on the side and cough. So whenever there is cough, because of the increased pressure, you can see a swelling. The moment that swelling comes out, if you're trying to push it with your fingers, it will go inside. That is a reducible hernia, okay, which is getting reduced. Irreducible, the name itself says you're not able to reduce this even after you're pushing all the contents inside. You're, you're not able to reduce the swelling. Contents in the hernia sac cannot be pushed back. That is irreducible. What is incarcerated? Incarcerated means there is an adhesion. Adhesion means there is a there is a gum like thing. It's as if you applied ferricol between the hernia sac contents and the sac and the hernia contents. There is some kind of uh, this and this have underwent adhesion. They're stuck to each other. That is called incarcerated hernia. Okay. And in this condition, reduction is difficult. Obviously, it is all attached to. If you're trying to push back, what happens? It will also pull the skin because of the adhesion. You can see incarceration like this. Hmm? Pe, even though there is incarceration, even though there is irreducibility, because the whole of that hernia opening, that 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 opening of the hernia sac, this is normal wall. Na? It, uh, imagine you're going down, you have a hole up, na? that hole is a little big. 
so if it is a very big hole and through that the contents are going it will not it will not cause obstruction it will not cause strangulation but imagine if the hole is very small what happens obstruction occurs strangulation occurs what is the difference between obstruction and strangulation obstruction is when blood supply nothing is happening to the blood supply but you not able to reduce it theek hai irreducible hai there is an obstruction it's not going inside it's tightly bound here but blood supply is intact what is strangulation strangulation is like cutting off the blood supply what happens if you cut off the blood supply it leads into necrosis so what happens if there is bubble necrosis it's a big it's a big emergency the patient lands up in a hospital in emergency is supposed to do emergency herniotomy or hernioplasty in that patient and she is supposed to remove of that part of the bubble because it has undergone necrosis it's a damage it's a loss hmm? so whenever if the patient suppose a patient comes to you with a hernia and you suspect that you are not able to push the contents it's irreducible and it's obstructed 100% to tell the patient to undergo a surgery because that patient can land up into strangulation and you don't want that if he enters ends up into strangulation i can also end up into shock death can occur you don't want that so you are anticipating that this might go into strangulation and especially irreducible hernias are very naughty to go into strangulation hernias you don't want that so you tell the patient to plan a surgery fast don't wait for long time till it is reducible chalta hai chalne do okay but if it is irreducible definitely think that this patient might end up into strangulation you definitely want the patient to undergo a surgery as fast as possible strangulation i've already told you blood supply to the hernial sac is compromised if surgical repair is not done hernia sac will become gangrenous gangrenous and it becomes necrotic there is no blood supply to that bubble so it will definitely die without oxygen inguinal hernia is content of the abdomen cavity nothing but whatever the bowels are there any any content of the abdomen cavity can herniate wherever according to the weakness of the wall through the inguinal canal you know you have inguinal canals here what is femoral always remember that if you have any kind of uh, hernia sac coming in the line of the inguinal canal or above the inguinal canal it's inguinal hernia sac but if it is coming below it it's a femoral hernia femoral hernia is occurring in the femoral triangle at the antero medial aspect of the thigh imagine your thigh okay anterior part medial part okay in between that's where you have your femoral triangle through that if the hernia comes which is very common in females it is called a femoral hernia contents produce protrude to the weak portion in the inner thigh umbilical hernia the name itself says through the umbilical hernia through the umbilical area umbilical is what belly button so wherever in that belly button you see now in some kids you have it some people have it it's mostly congenital congenital matlab the baby is born with it that area is weak so through that the bubble contents can come that's called of umbilical hernia protrusion of contents occurring at the umbilicus through the belly button so the baby is crying if the baby is like coughing sneezing you can see that umbilicus protruding outside then you are supposed to suspect an umbilical hernia in that child so here you can see this is how normal pinkish the bubble is the bubble is supposed to look yahan pe kya ho raha hai it is ending up into strangulation so all this area the blood supply is getting cut off the moment the blood supply gets cut off it will lead into gangrene here again you can see an inguinal hernia okay in a male patient you can see the intestine is coming out of this weakened hernia sac to the inguinal opening you have two rings you have deep ring you have superficial ring deep is in the medial part superficial is in the lateral part okay so if it is coming in from the medial ring deep ring it is called direct if it is coming from the superficial inguinal ring and through the deep ring that's indirect that's too much of depth just remember that inguinal ring or inguinal ligament is getting involved here it's inguinal ligament so you see this is how a normal uh, uh, male thing is supposed to look like in a male you can see a testis here this is the scrotum theek hai this is the scrotum sac so yahan pe the wall is normal so this is not getting this is not coming down 
because the wall is normal. This is how normal uh, anatomy is supposed to look like. Suppose you have a weakened wall. You can see the wall is coming down here, and because of the increased abdominal pressure, the contents are coming down into the scrotum. This is inguinal hernia into scrotum. Again, here also you can see it does not come down completely to the scrotum, but till a part of the just entering into it. It's in the canal. So you can see inguinal hernia in the canal. This is how this blue part, this white part, bluish white part is the abdominal wall, which is weakened through which the bubble is coming into the scrotum. See, you can see here, this is your inguinal ligament, and here say you're getting your inguinal hernia. You can see femoral hernia is below the ligament; it's not above the ligament. Whenever it is above, always suspect a inguinal hernia. If it is below this ligament, it is hundred percent femoral hernia, which is seen in the inner aspect of the thigh. And femoral hernias are more common in females. But if we ask you, what is the most commonest hernia? It is indirect inguinal hernia. Indirect inguinal hernia. Whether it is male or female, it is always in indirect inguinal hernia. But if he is asking you in female, which is the most commonest hernia? It is femoral hernia. There is a catch here. If they ask you in the exam, don't answer it wrong. If they are mentioning female. Then you take femoral. If they are asking over in male and females, if they are mentioning both, then it is indirect inguinal hernia. Okay. Right. This is umbilicus. You can see now belly button. Belly button. Say you are getting, you are you having bubbles protruding outside because of this weakened wall of this umbilicus. Hence, this is called umbilical hernia. You can see this is a child. This is a baby. You can see the baby very muggy. Very common is hernia seen in the babies. Next, All this is here. Saturday, we will all have Echo cancellation. Echo cancellation. Micro, microphone, not strict. I don't know. I don't know. Then the internet. Geo. Internet by the micro. Ah. We start at 10.45, no? It could start at some of class, 10.45. 10.45. Ah, well, 45 will end. Quals, Chal. In the good way. Ah, real tech here, no? How do you witness? Sir, it's keeping this. Have a look, if you have any confusion. Hmm. Okay. It's too fast for me. It's too fast for me. able to understand. I'm not going to depth well up here. It's a lot. 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 It's a I'm not going to use it.
వెయిట్ చేయాలా కొద్దిగా guys just give us 2 minutes there's some issue with the mic is it clear for your audio sir saying that there is some kind of echo just kindly let me know so let's just get back so we'll talk about candidiasis have you ever heard about candidiasis have you seen a patient with candida infection in the mouth which is called oral thrush it's called so it's called oral thrush this is oral candidiasis you can see a white layer over the tongue okay what can you hear okay thrush p h r u s h oral thrush so this is oral candidiasis candidiasis ante what it's a fungal infection caused by candida it's in the name you have a cheesy white everybody has cheese seen how cheese looks like right you have cheesy white plaque that looks like milk uh suppose you have milk and you curdle it curdle it ante em di accidentally you end up dropping a little bit of uh, nimbu in that what happens it becomes like paneer na that kind of uh, accumulation you see in the mouth or any other area wherever you have candidiasis if you rub this area it will bleed okay causative is candida albicans it's in the name candida is the causative albicans means what white okay it's a fungus what is the treatment you're giving antifungal medications if it is happening in the mouth you will give you put them on oral treatment or you have something called nystatin nystatin is something like uh, a oral liquid so you will ask a patient to swallow, you know take a little bit of liquid in the mouth gargle and spit it out or you can also give put them on oral tablets like itraconazole or fluconazole theek hai and then what yesterday i was telling you about caposis i was telling we had all in our paper we had at least 12 or 15 questions on hiv so they might repeat this trend for you also in the exam so be careful what is caposis sarcoma is oral mucosa in the mouth i'll show you the picture it will look reddish purple it will look swollen okay these lesions are called caposis sarcoma which you see in hiv patients yesterday i told you caposis sarcoma is because of uh which virus you know which virus it is caposis sarcoma is because of hhv8 hhv8 okay now uh, what do you do here it's a cancer so you supposed to do a radiation therapy or a chemotherapy or you surgically exercise exercise it completely what is gingivitis gingiva means what gingiva means what gums your gums are called gingiva you see your teeth you see that pink substance near your teeth that's called the gums or the gingiva okay if you have itis inflammation of the gingiva it is called gingivitis don't butty learn it understand the word you you know what the problem is so inflammation of the gums is what is gingiva when does it happen if you don't have a oral if you don't have a good hygiene of the mouth it will lead into irritation of the gingiva leading to gingivitis what is a dental plaque dental plaque matlab dental matlab what you know teeth anything to do with your teeth is dental so on the teeth you have a gel like substance adherence to the teeth normally they supposed to be neat it's supposed to be shiny okay how you see in the advertisements but most of us don't have it like that there is a covering on the on the not the enamel not the enamel over that you have a gel like substance 
which is not shiny. That's a, that's what's what called dental plaque. So if you have a proper mouth care, you're brushing your teeth properly at least once in the day. Okay, <laughs> using good amount, good toothbrush. Okay, using a good toothpaste. You having a oral hygiene, good oral hygiene. You will not have this problem. But if you don't do it, problem starts. What is periapical abscess? Uh, whenever you have a tooth below it or around it in the gingival area, you can have pus collection. You can have inflammation there. You can have an infection there. Whenever you have a pus collection, collection of pus is nothing but an abscess. If it is very small on your skin, it is called pustule. But if that becomes a little big, it becomes abscess. Okay. So abscess tooth with collection of pus in the apical dental periosteum. Just below the teeth, you'll have that accumulation and that this area will become nice swollen. They'll come with nice dawadanopi, dawadanopi. That's what we talk, we tell in uh, Telugu. So they, you have a nice swelling on your cheek also. They'll come holding like this. You should understand there is some issue with the teeth. It's abscess. Especially it happens in diabetic patients. Till if they don't have any kind of proper dental hygiene, or if they have some kind of old people, they'll have holes now, all the teeth fall off. All that food gets accumulated in that area. Whatever gets accumulated, it will end up into infection if they have high sugar. If you're feeding na, sugar, they're there, bacteria. Ko. Pe ja ke jam ke acha bada abscess ban okay. Then what is what we don't touch it. As medical, we don't touch it. It's all the dentist issue. <laughs> so we'll refer them to the dentist. We don't touch that area. What will what will the dentist do? Wherever you have an abscess, you drain it. Not cold abscess, hot abscesses. What is cold abscess is TB. It's a, it's a different procedure. But for hot abscesses, you have to drain it. You have to remove that collection of the pus. The moment you remove the pus, na, that patient will be It feels nice. Because that stretch pain is gone. They start feeling more comfortable. And then you treat them with antibiotics because it's an infection. There is no rocket science. Infection here, give antibiotics. Even if you don't have infection, in India, they still give antibiotics. All for flu, they're giving antibiotics. Please don't do that. Next, parotidus. Parotid glands are getting inflamed here. Parotid, which is itis. Hora. Itis means inflammation of the parotid glands. So inflammation of the parotid salivary glands. You have it here. This is your ear. You have it right here. Okay? You have a superficial and a deep uh, gland. Uske beach mein se facial nerve goes. Okay? So here, whenever you have parotid gland swelling, all this area is all swollen nicely. Even in people who drunk, drink a lot, your parotid glands will swell. Nicely, they'll look like this. Round, round, they'll look like this. You should suspect that this patient is drinking a lot. These are all nuske which we see in OP. Nicely, if they're swollen, you should ask. In the you should ask. How much, you do, how much do you take drinks per day? Okay. Now, most common organism, I told you, remember staph. Wherever you have a problem, staph is involved. Staph is like a nosy mother-in-law. Wherever it wants to create a problem, nicely it will create a problem and come back. So staph is one of the most commonest uh, bacteria causing infections in the body. So except mumps. Mumps is because of virus. You know mumps, na? kids come with the swelling of the parotid glands and they have fever. It's because of paramyxovirus. It's a viral problem. But if you have normal parotid gland swelling, think about staph. Okay. What do you do? Same. You have you need, you need to have a good oral hygiene. Okay. You're supposed to discontinue medications which diminish salivation. You need to have a good amount of salivation because you have to flush out all that toxin. So if there if the ducts get clogged now because of less salivation, this issues can occur. All these glands, the submandibular glands here, just below your jaw, or the submental. This is your mentum. You have your submental glands, you have your submandibular here, you have parotid glands here, all the salivary glands. They produce saliva. If you block that, if you're reducing the amount of salivation, they might have a problem. Dry mouth can occur and these problems can occur. Okay. What are the drugs which decrease salivation and anticholinergics? You don't have to know it, just remember it's anticholinergics, just for the heck of it. Okay. Next. Antibiotics and analgesics, pain is there. So you're relieving the pain by giving analgesics. There is infection, you're giving antibiotics. If it is too big, you're supposed to remove off the gland. What do you do? Ectomy. Ectomy means what? Removing. Parotid ectomy. Parotid is being removed. Ectomy is removal. That's the surgery of choice. This is candidiasis. This is called oral thrush. You can see all this uh, white accumulation. No? 
curdy white appearance even if the female patients come to you they will complain this is one of the most commonest infection fungal infections are very common so it can happen in the mouth it can also happen for patients especially female patients in the vaginal area you will see this curdy white precipitates if whenever you see curdy white kind of uh, accumulation in that uh, either in the mouth or niche in the vagina think about candida infection okay this is how the normally how your tongue is pinkish you don't have any kind of accumulation on your tongue right but if you have this kind of accumulation think about candida this is kaposis you can see no bluish red oral mucosa this is carcinoma which occurs in a hiv patient because of hhv8 this for this treatment because it's a carcinoma you do a radiotherapy or you do or you surgically surgically excise it or you give a chemo in this patient whenever you think about kaposi think about hiv first this patient is 99.9% hiv positive this is gingivitis you can see na this are your teeth normally you your gingiva is supposed to be pale pink in color not like this so irritated yahan pe it's all like rhesus back it is gone back it's all irritated here even if you touch it not to start bleeding this is gingivitis if you don't maintain good oral hygiene this is what is going to happen this is dental plaque you can see some kind of an yellowish covering huh this is dental plaque normally it is supposed to be white but if you take a lot of coffee and tea you will have coffee and tea stains that is different but this is a dental plaque it's like a gel like covering over the teeth yahan pe you can see na gums this is how normal gums look gingiva this is how normally it look but if it looks like this then it is gingivitis okay inflamed gums is gingivitis yesterday i made a mistake see even we are in learning process i made a mistake so scyphosis is outward so imagine old people old people what happens their spine bends na like this that is scyphosis if it is going more inside inward bending is lordosis which you see in pregnant women normally because what happens is there is gravid uterus growing inside in the large trimester niche ka jo spine hai na the sacral spine and the coccyx it that tail bone is getting pushed outwards so there is more curving you see na more curving will be there samne will have a nice pregnant belly but piche the back looks more curved it's called lordosis which we normally see in pregnant women in the last trimester and that is kind of little painful for them because the tail bone is getting pushed too much that is lordosis inward curvature is lordosis outward curvature like bending like that hunch back like that is called scyphosis and if you're sitting straight like this and you see spine is like this like a snake s shape it is scoliosis okay scoliosis is lateral curvature not forward or backward it's a lateral curvature scoliosis i'll show you pictures scyphosis is outward curvature lordosis is inward curvature so scoliosis is lateral lateral curvature of the spine scyphosis is outward curvature of the spine scyphosis matlab think about old people matlab bend hai potar wala that's scyphosis this is scyphosis and it is also known as humpback or dowager's hump dowager actually means uh in british era so if the husband dies the wife who still surviving she is called a dowager this word was used when you had uh, when you have dukes and all that in his history all uh, english history if you watch a lot of uh, um, if you read a lot of novels english novels historical novels you will get this word called dowager dowager and old old people old women okay so you'll have a dowager's hump like that what is lordosis i just told you it's an inward curvature of the lumbar spine especially seen in pregnant women and obese people obese people may what happens is all that fat will push the coccyx outside it will cause more curvature inward curvature it will cause them severe pain especially these people complain of lower back pain what do most of the pregnant women complain ah oh, i'm not able to sit please put a pillow behind na i'm feeling very uncomfortable they, they won't be able they want to lie down so that is what an inward curvature an excessive pushing of the coccyx outside can cause severe lower back pain for this pregnant women or obese women and that is what is called lumbar lordosis this is scoliosis lateral curvature patient is straight you can see na patient is standing straight and here you have lateral curvature here dikh raha hai na ha 
So this is scoliosis. Remember S, scoliosis. Okay. This is kyphosis. This is a humpback. This is kyphosis. You see this nine old people. Bahad old ho to kaisa rathe, they'll be holding a cane and be walking like that. This is kyphosis, which happens in old women or old men. This is normal spine. Normally also your spine is not straight. It has slight curvature. Okay. And skyphosis is more outward, outward curvature of the spine. Lordosis is more inward curvature of the spine. This is hyperlordosis. This is skyphosis. Again, you see, this is normal spine. Here you can see this is normal. This, this much amount of curvature is normal. But if it is going off too much inside, this coccyx is there, now it will be pushed outside. In this, in this area, they'll have intense pains. These people can't sit for a long time. They want to lie down all the time. Here you can see how much is inside. This is lordosis. What is disc prolapse? So, uh, yesterday we learned that we have vertebral column. First seven vertebra are cervical. Next 12 vertebra are thoracic. And then you have five sacral vertebra. Then you have lumbar vertebra. And lumbar ke baad you have sacrum. And then sacrum ke baad you have coccyx. Sacrum is all fused vertebra. You have five fused vertebra. So there is no disc there. Niche coccyx, your tailbone has four vertebra. It is all again fused. So no disc. Only unfused vertebra ke beech mein, you have this chewing gum like substance, which is called a disc. Okay. And again, in between your first cervical vertebra, which is called atlas, and seven, second cervical vertebra, which is called axis, again, you don't have a disc. But these areas may have no disc. Baki sir, vertebra ke beech mein, you have a disc. Why do you need a disc? It is to prevent, it is to give nutrition to the two vertebras. It is to prevent bone rubbing from bone, to prevent that kind of friction pain. So it keeps, it's like a shock absorber. It is to keep the movement. If you don't have this disc, your bone will be straight. Your vertebral column will be straight. Neither can you bend forward, neither can you move here. You can't do katakali if you don't have this disc. It will be like straight like this. And they, you can't move at all if you don't have this disc. So this disc helps you in movement. They give nutrition. They give blood supply. Through that, arteries also go. Okay. And then third thing, they prevent this friction. So what happens is, if let's imagine you're seeing a disc from above. Okay. This is how it will look like disc. So this is all called annulus of the disc. Annulus. See if the spelling is wrong. Sorry. Kindly check it with the dictionary. And this is the nucleus pulposus. So kya hota hai? This annulus, this ring, which is there, it will become weak. So once this weak, this becomes weak, na, this also will come like a hernia. It will come out like a sac. Isse kya hota hai? Iske andar se this nucleus pulposus will come and herniate. And normally, you have your spine like this. And in this, these are all your nerves coming out. If this is coming out and compressing your nerve, which is going out, what happens? Nerve is getting compressed. Na? Whichever area the nerve is getting compressed or whichever nerve is getting compressed, whatever area that nerve is supplying will have a problem. Simple. Hmm? So the disc is herniating outside. That is called prolapse. Prolapse means what? It is not staying in its place. It is coming out of its place. This is how it can come out. That nucleus pulposus, the nucleus of the disc comes out. And it causes compression on the nerve. Till it comes out, it's okay. At the max, the patient can complain of pain. But if it comes out and causes pressure symptoms on the nerve, then problem starts. Because that nerve is getting compromised. Okay. Nucleus of the disc protrudes into the annulus, causes nerve compression. I've just explained you. I'll show you a picture. What happens once the nerve is getting compressed, nerve supply is cut off, you'll have numbness, either you can have pain or you can have tingling in one or both arms. Wherever it is getting compressed, that area will have this tingling, numbness, pain, paresthesias, because nerve is getting involved. Next. Uh, Whichever area, I just told you, pain behind the shoulder blades, if that area is getting compressed, that nerve is getting compressed. Or you can have pain in the buttocks, if the sciatic, the sciatic nerve which comes out, now if that is getting compressed, then you can have problem. In severe cases, what happens is, you have chorda equina. Na? You know what is chorda equina. 
सो नीचे के पार्ट में हाव यू सीन हॉर्स टेल हाउ डज द हॉर्स टेल लुक्स लाइक गुर्रम दी टेल आई डोंट नो व्हाट यू कॉल इन तो गुर्रम तो सो यू हैव द हॉर्स टेल यू नो हाउ दैट हॉर्स टेल लुक्स इमेजिन दैट्स हाउ आर कॉडा इक्विना द कॉडा इक्विना इज द लास्ट एंड ब्रांचेस ऑफ द नर्व्स ऑल दीस थिंग्स विल गो एंड सप्लाई द मेजर ऑर्गन्स नीचे ब्लड और टेक्टम एंड ऑल दोस एरियाज आर ऑल सप्लाइड बाय दिस कॉडा इक्विना सो इफ दोस आर गेटिंग कॉम्प्रोमाइज्ड ना you lose control on the bladder you lose control on the bowels you can have numbness in the genital area hmm? and impotence in men that's a major problem for men yeah so location of the symptoms depends on the location of the prolapse wherever you have the prolapse whichever nerve is getting involved that part is compromised simple very severe cases may only bladder and all that imagine the patient loses bladder control Firstly, papa, it's very embarrassing for the patient. You have to wear diapers. They have no control on it. They might urinate suddenly, or they might not have urination at all. That's again, both of them are problem. Here, pe you can see, uh, this is the disc. This black areas are all disc. So you have taken uh, image here. Pe all these are vertebra. This all whitish areas, all vertebra. In between them, you have this disc. Here, pe you can see the disc is getting protruded. And this is your spinal column. This is your spine. This is your vertebral column. In between the vertebral column is what your spinal cord. This is going and compressing the spinal cord. So whichever nerve gets compromised here, that problem develops. So here, pain between the L5 and L4 area, you are seeing a disc prolapse. This is one of the commonest areas for disc prolapse. Where do you get spinal anesthesia? Either in this area. Or in L3, L4. These are the two areas, favorite areas for the anesthetists to to give spinal to put anesthesia for spinal anesthesia. Here you can see disc prolapse. Why you giving in that area is in adults the spinal cord stops off at L1, L2. So below that, कहाँ पे भी दे सकते हो. Even you're pushing a needle inside, you'll not uh, cause any kind of issue to the spine because the spinal cord ends off. वहां से ऑल द एंड ब्रांचेस कम है कॉडा इक्विना ब्रांचेस कम ठीक है सो या आई वाज टॉकिंग नो दिस इज द एन्युलस एन्युलस दिस इज द न्यूक्लियस यू कैन सी ना हाउ इट इज कमिंग आउट एंड इट इज कॉजिंग कंप्रेशन ऑन दिस नर्व नेक्स्ट कमिंग बैक टू क्रॉन्स एंड अल्सरेटिव कोलाइटिस सो आई विल जस्ट गो वेरी फास्ट विद दिस क्रॉन्स आई हैव जस्ट टोल्ड यू इट हैज स्किप लीजंस अल्सरेटिव कोलाइटिस इज कंटीन्यूअस Ulcerative colitis occurs in rectum and the colon. Crohn's can occur anywhere. Ulcerative colitis can develop into a colon cancer. Crohn's is rare, and most of the ulcerative colitis patients have bloody diarrhea, and they they present with diarrhea and abdominal pain. ठीक है. And remember, if you get cobblestone appearance, think about Crohn's. C say Crohn's, C say cobblestone. This is how cobblestone looks like because you won't have image base. This might not make sense for you. This is also we'll skip this also. See, a cobblestone appearance was found in some lesions. There's something called Kirkring folds because of that. This cobblestone form here. You can see this. Where are they? Are they? You should miss this picture. It's difficult. This is your cobblestone. Middle you can see, no, all these normal areas. Because this is because of your Kirkring rings. Don't remember that. Just remember this is how the cobblestone looks. This is how your bubble looks. All these areas are normal. Okay, this is all normal. And these are all polypoidal lesions of Crohn's. You see cobblestone and Crohn's, not in ulcerative colitis. How will you remember? C for C, Crohn's is C. C for Crohn's, C for cobblestone. he might ask that question for you just remember next rectal involvement is there bloody diarrhea is there left sided pain bullet the first think about ulcerative colitis that can if you ignore it now for a long time if you don't maintain dietary uh, if you don't maintain a proper diet and you're continuously causing irritation in that area it can lead into cancer ulcerative colitis can lead into colonic cancer you have all this here uh itla you have this kind of a tabular form for you 
we have in this much of depth you understood na cobblestone is seen in crons it don't seen in ulcerative ulcerative can cause cancer ulcerative is continuous it is causing uh, causative the area which is involved is rectum and colon but for crons it is mostly ileum and colon theek okay? ileum and cecum in that area so right sided rectum but otherwise crons can occur anywhere in the gi tract and has kidney lesions it's not continuous if they ask you about fistulas okay just remember that crons may have fistulas but in ulcerative colitis you won't have fistulas but if they ask you about abscesses this is wrong crypt abscesses is formed in ulcer okay let's not discuss this slide too much for you guys <laughs> let's not discuss jitna i told you just remember that now we we'll talk about amputation shall we call it day today and hmm? the two hours i can okay guys uh, we'll do amputation tomorrow because i think too much of information today and i'm very sure you guys have to digest all this it is oh murli sir thank you sir is answering sir chat box la answer yes sir <laughs> okay guys we we'll call it a day today i hope you guys like today's class i'll take uh, reviews from alekya who's sitting here even you guys can tell me tomorrow if there if i have to be more slow for you or the speed is okay thank you so much for having me today so i am not there for five days uh, because i'm i'm going out of station so in these uh, five days kindly please uh, you know read all which i have told you in these two days yesterday's and today's topics that's almost uh, easily 170 slides so these videos are still there that is what uh, murli sir has told me so you guys please have a review if you want to hear uh, to this again or you can actually see your books thank you so much guys have a nice day have a nice weekend thank you murli sir and then no broadcast and